This morning I'm going to talk about a couple different things. I'm going to talk about grace. I want to talk about healing. The reason I want to talk about healing is not because, um, you know, here's what I can understand. Uh, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And so even though we really uh, emphasize healing early on when this whole COVID thing broke out, uh, we really, we've talked about it in a general way, but we really want to reinforce that. Amen. Because uh, give us this day our daily bread. So there's nourishment in daily partaking of God's words in certain areas, isn't there? Nourishment comes to you. And, and matter of fact, is uh, Charles Cap, he had a quote years ago that said, uh, a daily affirmation of God's word will build into your system a supernatural anointing capable of eliminating any sickness or disease on a natural plane. A daily affirmation. Well, before you can make an affirmation, you've got to let the word dwell richly in your heart, don't you? So Proverbs tells you, my son, attend to my word, or my daughter, attend. Give some attention. Incline thine ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. To keep them in the midst of your heart. Because your heart is the central core place where everything flows out. For, for uh, all the issues of man flow out of your heart. And we can say, what's going on in the world today? It's really a faith issue and a love issue. It's a love issue and a faith issue. Whether someone has love or not does not negate the fact that the problem that they have is a love issue. Right? The antidote for, for anger, right, is love. Because anger is a byproduct of fear. Right? Fear creates anger. When a person's threatened, their response is an emotional uh, how do you think? discharge, an emotional expression of anger, right? It's born from fear. See, that's the difference between when Jesus walked into the temple and the anger of the man. Because James tells us, uh, uh, mm, be angry and sin not, for the anger of man does not promote, produce the righteousness of God. Yes. So most of our anger is a byproduct of fear, of being threatened, of, of what you're taking from me, what I'm not getting, uh, what I'm missing out on. What about me? It's all a byproduct. So when fear is prevalent, anger is the response immediately in some form or fashion. When I'm disrespected, fear says that. I'm disrespected. You can't be disrespected, right? In a sense, you can, people can have opinions of you. People can devalue you externally. But ultimately, if you know who you are in Christ, you know you're raised up. You know you're accepted of love. You know you're holy without blame. You know he loves you with an everlasting love. Every time something externally occurs outwardly to try to undermine and chis chisel away who you are inside, and so the reality is who you are inside. You have to yield to that. See, because if you yield to what someone else is doing, which so many times happens because we don't renew our minds, as Romans 12 tells us, right? That's why he tells us. Look, go, look at that real quick, Romans 12, and then we'll get to Titus. Romans 12. Ooh, I'm excited to share this word this morning. Because it is the grace of God. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all God's mercies to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy and devoted. It's well pleasing to God. It's your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Oh, don't be conformed to this world fashion. See that? Fashioning yourself. Now, I'll just take a small journey here. People love fashion. When there's magazines that show the latest fashion, people run out and buy all that stuff so they can uh, uh, clothe themselves and get the latest fashions so that there's a connection they feel with, you know, being uh, contemporary, I guess you would say, right? But the reality is he tells us not to fashion ourselves like the world, Right? Don't fasten yourself like the world. Don't adapt yourself to it. See that once again, the word is external. Superficial ways. What do you mean? Superficial. 
They don't last. There's no longevity. They're phony. They're weak. They're ingenuine. Aren't they? How many, can I be truthful? How many of you like superficial people? I mean, really? I don't like superficial people. I'm just, I love them with the love of God, but I prefer, I mean, I hate superficial people. I mean, actually, let me retract that. I don't hate them personally, but I hate their expressions, their behavior, and their falsities. Superficial, meaning they really don't want to connect with you as a friend. They're really ingenuine. They don't really have you in their heart. You know what I mean? If you're, if you're having some fellowship with them or whatever, they, they have some reasoning. They're there. They're not there just to build a relationship and have a, a, a friendship that has a longevity and lasting communion. They're there for other reasons, right? And that doesn't mean that you and I don't have challenges in relationship. See, that's the thing. You can have disagreements and challenges in relationships, but if you break a relationship, because of a disagreement or a challenge, I'm not talking about marriage now, because marriage is a whole, a whole other bathtub or a whole other swimming pool, okay? But just as friends, say you had friends and friends, you know, even you shouldn't allow whether you believe in the, uh, the, the racism issues or not, don't let it unsettle you and take you away. Your friendship and the, and the experiences you had should be stronger than your populism, your, pre your present opinion. Because you break away over issues, you say, I gotta stand for my issues. Well, why don't you stand for the truth? Right? Doesn't mean you call wrong right, it just means you're willing to be like Jesus, right? A peacemaker. What is a peacemaker? One that stays in one accord and one mind and one heart, right? It's like you say, you can agree to disagree, but you don't trash your relationship. I've had disagreements with friends, but ultimately, here's what I can say. Do you know when you have a disagreement with somebody or a conflict? Let's just, let's keep this real. Do you know that they probably have some aspect of truth in what they're saying? Do you know that? So let's just say uh, I have a disagreement with Brother Kim here. That some of what he's saying, somewhere in his uh, uh, communication, there's going to be some truth about what he's saying. And somewhere in mine, there's going to be some truth. But the problem is, is everybody thinks they're 100% right and accurate. And that their view is thus saith God. That's the problem. Because what happens, and that's, that is actually a form of pride, where we're not willing to at least look, evaluate, and examine that perhaps there is some truth to what's being said from the other side. How many of you understand? And it takes time to even recognize, no matter how mad and angry they are, that there could be. See, here's, what, here's what's taking me a little time. You have to separate the person's mode of communication from the information that they're communicating. Does that make sense? How they're presenting it and what they're saying are two different things. But it's many times hard to hear somebody communicating, hear what they're saying because their mode it's so abrasive, it's so disruptive, it's so mean, it's it's uh, distorted, right? Because they, they've moved away from self-control and they've moved into just uh, speaking that out of their emotions. That doesn't mean that some of what they're saying isn't true. So it takes time for you to have to weed through what is something that I can take a look at and what is something, how many understand what I'm saying? You know, it takes time. And if you and I aren't filled with the Holy Ghost, man, what happens is relationships just break then. You're like, Shh, forget that person, you know, or whatever. You're just not willing to deal with it. But here's the factor. You see that with people. You see it. Real love stays the course. Real love is willing to work through the complications, the challenges, and the problems and dilemmas that beset life. Right? You can't just throw things away. Right? And that's what the devil wants. Because that's what the devil does. The devil uses and then throws you away. On top of that, he tells you, uh, you know, the reason you're being thrown away is because you are a piece of trash. So you deserve to be thrown away. That's what the devil sells you. He tries to convince you of that. To persuade you. Amen? And the Lord 
uh, has something else to persuade you about. So I, I kind of got off on the superficial thing, but it says be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by new ideals, new attitude, so that you will prove for yourself. See, you, you don't have to prove nothing to anybody. And what I've learned is this, you know, because we all go through different things. You're trying to prove something to people. You ain't gonna prove nothing to nobody. You can do something correct, right, and they still ain't gonna never say that you're right. You proved it right. They won't because of pride, because of conceit, because of arrogance. Uh, lots of people can't ever say they're wrong. They have a very hard time just to say, hey, I was wrong, man. I didn't see clearly. I had a wrong perspective at the time. I was emotionally charged, stimulated. Uh, that was wrong of me. They have a very hard time. I know lots of Christians, they have a very hard time just saying, uh, I'm wrong. And even when you know you're wrong, you got to say it, man. That's what the Bible says. Confess your faults one to another. Confess to one another. And it's good to confess it to God, but God's not the one you just offended. That's, God's not the one you hurt. Right? I mean, yeah, you hurt God and all that, but God hurts because we hurt other people. We've all done it. There ain't nobody ain't done it. And if they say they have, they're a liar. You, you know? And you and I don't like liars. Liars challenge you because they're trying to convince you of something. They're trying to sell you uh, an idea. They're trying to sell you their perspective when you already know, like, dude, or woman, or whatever it is. Like, it doesn't matter if you're right. You're not hearing what I said. And that's where you got to separate their means of communication from what's being said. And it takes time. I've been ignorant of that, but you learn, you know. And, but the main thing is, is if you and I live our lives constantly in the love of God, we'll endeavor not to offend people intentionally. Here's the reality. You're going to offend people as soon as you wake up and walk out of your house and say, Man, I love God. Jesus is Lord. Right away, you could just offend somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, puts you know, but you can't control everybody. You can't control their emotions, how they see you. But you can do your best and your utmost to live peaceably with all people. Amen. Amen. Peacefully. And there's a lot of very ingenuine people. A lot of very ingenuine. I don't think we're sitting here in this church. I really believe that because you wouldn't be sitting here. We've been through a shipwreck together and came out. Amen. Our anchor's pulled up and we're moving. Yeah. Glory to God. Amen. It's like that little bee that John Osteen talked about. He stomped on a bee and that thing dusted itself off and was flickering. <laughs> and then that, and then he, see, he tried to stomp on it again and went in the sand. And then that bee comes, zzz, 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 came, buzzed himself right out of that sand. And, and the Lord spoke to him and he said, that bee has a lot of want to. <laughs> and then the Lord said to Joe Osteen, I mean, uh, 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 John Osteen, how bad is your want to? See, your want to keeps you going, doesn't it? Your want to. And sometimes you start in the flesh, and then you, you, you get to move it, amen, in the spirit. Your want to is important. Your want to is kind of like faith, okay? So here it is. Offer your bodies to live inside Christ. Prove yourself that perfect will of God. That which is good and acceptable in his sight. In his sight. How are you and I, what, here's, here's what I'm saying is, we always ask people, how are they living in the sight of God? Well, that's not the question we should be asking, because we focus on people's behavior. What we should be asking is, what are their heart motives? What's going on internally before the sight of God? See, you can do everything outwardly and look like Mr. Mr. Clean or Mrs. Clean, you know what I mean? But inwardly, not be right. And that's what Jesus opposed, didn't he? He told the Pharisees, you make the outside of the cup clean, but inside, on the inside, there was other things. Extortion, hatred, unforgiveness. There was all kinds of other things inside. And so it's important. And now you and I can take that position like, oh, I'm walking in love. Yeah, but that's an aspect of it. Because if you're truly walking in love, you will ensure that relationships are right. See, even Jesus said, don't you come to worship me, leave your gift at the altar, and go make it right with your brother or your sister. So I don't know how people pray, and then they just, Lord, bless that person, and, and I forgive them. But, but see, if you truly forgave them, if you truly love them, you would endeavor to reconcile at some level, some capacity. You would reach out. See, God came to the world. He didn't wait for the world to come to him. 
The world was in a sinful, fallen, dark place. God came to the world, gave himself for us. So I'm amazed at how many people sit back and they self-righteously wait for the other person to come to them. When the reality is, is those that are strongest in the love of God, even if they're not the guilty one, always humble themselves, always reach out, always endeavor to reconcile. How many of you understand? Because you're not just reconciling uh, 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 horizontally with man. You are vertically communing. Because you have to see, 1 John tells you. 1 John tells you. If you walk in the light as he is in the light. I said we were going to get over to Titus, but I'm just going to quote this to you real quick. In 1 John. 1 John tells us this. 1 John. Let's see. First John 4, 16, we know and understand, we are conscious of by observation and experience, and we believe and we put faith in, we put faith in, and we rely on the love God cherishes for us. God is love. He who dwells and continues in love dwells and continues in God, and God dwells and continues in him. In this union and communion, love is brought to completion and attains perfection. See, if you don't dwell in love, then God isn't operating and manifesting in your life. Now, I'm not talking about God manifesting just in your material area, but I'm talking about manifesting in you with love, and joy, and peace, and genuine goodness. Uh, I, I'm not going to try to use myself as an example, but yesterday I was coming out of the bank, and there was a guy, I don't know if he was homeless or on drugs, he was sitting right there, and I was coming out of the bank, and I, and I, and have a lot, I just had some money I got, and I had it in my hand, and I was walking out, and that brother, I knew he was going to look right at me, man. And I had it in my hand and put it in my pocket. And he's like, hello, sir, or something. And right away, just, I became real self-centered and fearful. And I went, what's up, man? Just walked off. Well, because fear, fear quenched and stifled that love in me. And, and, and it doesn't matter. You know, I could have just said, sir, I don't have anything for you today. But I, I got real defensive and real self-centered and real, you know, fearful. Not that he was going to take it, but just that he wanted something. And all of a sudden, I got a couple steps, and the love of God in me said, pull your wallet out and go give a couple dollars. So I just, you're right, man, absolutely, Lord. Just, God didn't say it, but the love of God in me did. You understand what I'm saying? Because I recognized my immediate response was not God. That doesn't mean you have to give to everybody homeless. But I'm saying it wasn't a right response mentally and emotionally. So I reconciled that thought and those feelings and those emotions with who I really am. Come on now. Yeah. Who I really am yeah. on the inside. And then I acted on that. So you got to know and believe and then act on that love. And then just walked up and say, here you go, brother. Have a great day. You know, because I didn't have to give him all my money. The point is, is immediately, you know, and, and that just teaches us how to be more conscious of God, you know, and less fearful. And of course, I, I addressed that right there. I addressed it, and I drove it out. Perfect love casts out fear. Drive it out. And you and I have many opportunities all day long with people, with situations. So when you dwell in love, see, I kept my harmony with God. Now, I couldn't just hop in my car and say, no, dig me, and throw away. But see, to me, that's an insensitive and dull heart. Some people just walk by, and they're no biggie. And, they, and, of course, people say, well, Jesus just walked by lots of people. Well, Peter at the gate of beautiful said, Walk by silver and gold, have I none, such as I have. Name in Jesus, such as I have. What's important? I guess I could have preached the gospel to them, but I, I, I wasn't prompted. I had something I had to be where I'd be, but I gave them something I was gracious and courteous about. It. The whole problem was it wasn't about him asking. There's nothing wrong with asking. Ask you shall receive. 
it was my mind thinking, you shouldn't be asking me. Why shouldn't he be asking you? No, you know, and, and allowing my mind to have influence is my brain. And so many times we allow our minds and our emotions to dominate us in the world. And this is why it says, be transformed, that you know that perfect will. Now go over to Titus real quickly. Let me share a couple of verses with you. Titus chapter 2. Titus 2. Titus 2 is like 15. 15. There it is. Titus 2. No. Titus 2, verse 11. Let me get over there. Uh, Titus 2. Verse 11. Titus 2, here it is. Titus 2. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness, worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. The grace of God that brings salvation. Now, I want to talk about the grace of God because there's grace for all kinds of things. Right? His grace is sufficient to give you strength. Uh, uh, St. Corinthians 8 9 talks about grace to abound financially. Right? Uh, uh, the scriptures teach us, we'll cover some other things, that uh, salvation is brought to you by grace through faith. Right. It's not of yourselves. There's, a, there's a, a grace to avoid many of these things right here that try to seep in and try to ensnare our lives and, and choke out and 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 uh, neutralize the life of God on the inside. So he says the grace of God, there's grace for healing. There's grace for freedom. There's grace to reign. Amen? Yes, amen. So I'm going to, uh, in a few, I'm going to transition, transition into healing because there's grace for healing. Now let's talk about this. The grace of God that brings salvation. What is salvation? Deliverance and preservation from sin, the consequences of sin, and, and, and deliverance from every and anything there is to be delivered from. That's what the scriptures say. When you look that word up, soteria, right? Saved, salvation, soteriology, it means to be delivered and preserved from judgment and everything there's to be delivered from. See, Jesus' work was a it was a complete work. Amen? And so when it says the grace of God, it's actually talking about a person. The grace of God is just not some unknown spiritual force that is at work. That's the power of God. The grace of God is a person. The Lord Jesus. Amen? The grace of God is God's gift to you and I. Divine favor. Un unmerited, unearned, unworked for, given to you freely. Now, in one sense, how you respond to that grace will make all the difference in your life and in other people's lives. Because your life affects and impacts other people. Do you know that? Your life affects and impacts other people's lives in, in many positive ways as well as many uh, negative ways at times. So, your understanding of God's grace uh, will determine what you walk in in this earth. Okay? Let's look at this verse right here. Uh, go over, well, I'll go wrong. Oh, let me read it to you right here in uh, this translation right here. It says, uh, I'm reading from the TPT translation, a different translation. God's marvelous grace. Now, let's just think about grace. What is grace? unmerited favor and loving kindness. And actually the word grace has the uh, idea of God's divine influence upon your heart, upon the human heart. It is God's life freely distributed and given to you to influence, transform, change your life. Freely given to you, unearned, can't labor for it, can't work for it. All one can do is receive it. By trust, by faith. So this translation says, God's marvelous grace. Why is it marvelous? Because there's nothing you can do to there's nothing you can do to earn it. There's nothing you can do to buy it. It's given to you. It's free. 
And you'll spend a whole lifetime, you know, uh, renewing your mind and going from one place of grace to the next. Grace is an essential established work and a finished work, but it is a perpetual, ongoing, everyday understanding. Amen? You've got to walk in the grace of God every day. Yes. Walking is unmerited favor. See, here's the part where some people, because of whatever reason, I'm not going to attack them, they're, they're ignorant, without knowledge or, or without revelation, and that's this, is that uh, they think grace is just, I don't have to do anything anymore. That uh, they uh, somehow uh, misunderstand what James says. Faith without works is dead. So they attribute faith and works to you working, and that is an expression of your faith. So, so in a sense, by you staying holy, then that means that, that you're under the grace of God. You can live unholy for a period of time and be under grace because God gives space to repent. He gives opportunity. Now, you can't go on and live your whole life uh, you know, waywardly and ungodly and dishonestly and lying, cheating, stealing, robbing, and conniving. You can't perpetually live that way and have the life of God in you. You just can't. You can't. That means that you never were born again. Because once you were born again and the life of Jesus came in you, he begins to affect. He's all the while at work. He's all over to will and do business pleasure. So really, a great majority of the work that God does on the inside of you has to do with you just simply listening and hearing him and responding. See, I can't talk anybody out of evil. You know that? All you can do is communicate truth. See, Jesus said, when you hear the truth and know that truth, the truth will make you free. But here's the thing. You can be speaking truth all day long. But if a person doesn't receive that as their truth, it won't set them free. They can receive it as a truth. There's lots of religions that go, well, Jesus is a prophet. But they don't receive Jesus as the truth. See, there's a difference. They'll go, well, he's a prophet. So they like his works. They like his philosophies. They like his, his, you know, his words. But he's not Lord and Savior. So they don't perceive him as the way, the truth, and the life. They, they don't see Jesus as that. So Jesus then won't be able to impact their life. Now, I'm not saying that he ain't trying to impact. Because how many know if you hear the word, there's something supernatural about hearing God's word. That just hearing it, and somehow we've seen people that have kind of been opposed to it. And over a period of time, somehow that truth begins to take root. And, and then it bears fruit in some season. That's not everybody, but it, it has. So the reality is this, is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by him. That's what Jesus said. He defined it. He established it. And there is no other way but through him. So when you hear the truth, you know that truth. It becomes recognized to you, and you receive it as your truth. That's when that truth then brings freedom and liberty to you. That's when that truth goes in and breaks up the bondage of this world. That's when that truth gets into your thinking and transforms your thoughts and your mind. And God's thoughts begin to have dominance. God's thoughts begin to be released. You begin to think differently, talk differently, act differently. So you can't change man's behavior. That's religion. Right? Do's and don'ts. That's what the law was about. All you can do is allow Jesus in his word to teach you. The grace teaches you. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. What does it do? What does grace do? Grace ain't just, Lord, I'm tired of today. I need some grace. Grace. No. What does the grace do? It teaches you. Grace teaches you. You know, it teaches you through the word, but do you know sometimes... You're taught by your own experience, meaning it has its it has its foundation in the word. For instance, you've been you've been a, a person that held a grudge against somebody, and all of a sudden you're reading the scriptures and you see something like Colossians three twelve through fifteen that says, uh, "Forbearing one another, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you." And you see that, it jumps out and connects with your heart, and it prunes and purges away 
your own understanding. And when you see that truth, you go, oh man, I've had animosity. I've had an account against somebody, whether they're a sinner or, or a believer. You see that, and right there, the grace of God teaches you that what you're doing is wrong. Even if that person did something to you, even if they did something to you, because Jesus essentially said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they've done. So right away, anytime you and I get offended at anybody, we hold a grudge against anybody, we have animosity or unforgiveness, right away, you and I should go, forgive them. They know not what they did. I mean, that can save you a whole lot of, you know, all of a sudden you're driving your car and someone cuts you off the parking. You go, forgive them. They know not what they do. You know, your, your husband or wife says that. You go, forgive her. She know not what she does. Forgive him. He know not what he does. Your boss at work, yeah, he know not what he does. I mean, just think how holy, how powerful you'd be, how blessed you'd be. If you just walk around all the time, like, forgive them. They know not what they done. The devil comes and says, look at how they spoke bad about you, gossiped about you, put you down, stole from you, lied about you. Gee, you go, sorry, devil, they, I forgive them. They know not what they're doing. I mean, that's it. If you just ran around, they don't know what they're doing. And you start speaking that over every situation. The guy sells you something, he sells you a lemon car, and right away the devil will see he burned you dead. He was trying to get over on you. You go, now he know that what he does. <laughs> Forgive him. I'm serious. You see, you see it here. But it, it's one thing to see in church and then to go out and apply that in your life. Exactly. You know? I've had to say it a lot of times towards time. You can know that what he did. I mean, but you don't think of that because your emotions and your mind and the offense rises up. And you yield, I'll tell you, if you yield to unforgiveness and offense, you yield it to the devil himself. You yield it to the devil himself. First John tells you. First John tells you. You walk in darkness, you're blinded. And the enemy's number one tool is offense. It ain't getting you on drugs and alcohol. And, and whatever else externally. His number one thing is to sow a seed of discord offense to divide you from God first. How does he do it? If you're divided from your brother, you're divided from God. You say, no, I ain't. Yes, you are, friend. According to scripture, you're out of love. And the brother Hagin said, a step out of love is a step out of God. It don't matter what anyone done to you. You got to forgive them. Forgive them. So the grace teaches you then, like, oh, so you learn. Because nobody wants to have that big H word. You know that big H word? What's that big H word? What's the big H word that no one likes to have? You can just get all kind of Christians mad if you say this. What's the big H word? No. <laughs> when a Christian doesn't apply and live according to what he's been saying. Hypocrite. Nobody wants to feel like they're a hypocrite. Nobody. That's the worst word, man. Someone to just assault your character and tell you you're a hypocrite. That's the worst thing. That's demonic. Because you know the people that always do that? That guy's a hypocrite. You know, they're, they're bigger hypocrites because the reality is what they're saying is, you should have been perfect like me. That's what they're saying. They're saying, you should have been perfect like me. But they're not in church. They're not saved. They don't know the Lord. And they got all kind of failures and flaws and character defects going around in their life. But they're telling every Christian, you're a hypocrite. They tell every Christian, Christians are hypocrites. But, you know, the reality is, is the Lord would tell them, I'd like you to look in the mirror. See, when you know... If, let me ask everybody in here, and even people watching. Do you have the potential to be a hypocrite? Raise your hand. We all do. You know what keeps us from being hypocritical? The love of God. Staying in his word. Staying open to his direction and leadership and counsel. A lot of people say, I'll never be a hypocrite. I hear you. 
You're a hypocrite right there. <laughs> I'd never be a hypocrite. I know you're just so perfect. You've done everything right, but I can't wait till you stand before Jesus. It's like the one guy, you know, he came in and beat his chest before the Lord and said, Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner. And the other came, Lord, you know, and the Lord put this in there for reasons. Lord, you know I've been tithing and feeding the poor. And, you know, Lord, I've been so holy and I pray four times a day and all this. And the Lord said, who went down justified? See, the one man depended upon his, his own Christian works, so to speak, his, his own uh, uh, deeds. I mean, you should pray a lot. Pray as much as possible. Cease not to pray and give thanks. Pray always. Just don't put your, your confidence because you are a person that prays every day. Well, I'm an intercessor. You just don't understand. I'm, a, I'm an intercessor. I think it's the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Yeah. Amen? Amen. We all learn, don't we? So the grace of God teaches you. Uh, deny ungodliness. Now, here's what I want to say. What is ungodliness? What is ungodliness? Anything not godly. So when I say ungodliness, you have a certain idea. A certain thought comes to your life. What is ungodliness? Is sickness ungodly? Yes. yes. Okay. Is sickness ungodly? Yeah. Because if Isaiah 53 tells you he was wounded for your transgressions, Bruised for your inequities, the chastisement needful to obtain peace and well-being for you is upon him. And with your stripes, with excuse me, with your stripes, with his stripes, you were healed, yes. made whole, made well. So if, if Jesus died to make you well, then sickness must be ungodly. Like one person said, on what day did God create sickness in the seven days that He created the world and humanity? On what day did He ever say, ah, "Let me let a little sprinkling"? Sickness in there. Sickness is brought about by the curse, by the fall of man. The fall of man is ungodly. Amen? Let's look at Romans 5 real quick. Romans 5. Romans 5. Romans 5. Romans 5. Uh, Romans 5, we're going to read in uh, verse, I believe, 6. Romans 5, we're going to read out verse 6. Just reinforcing a few truths that we already know. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the what? Ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for every race and every human being that ever was, is, and is to come. Right? For the ungodly, those that weren't right, those that didn't have right standing with God, those that were uh, part of the first Adam, those whose nature was of the first Adam. And out of that nature came sickness. Right? So the, the, the grace of God teaches us to deny anything ungodly. Alright? Anything wrong. And I, I'm taking it past just behavior, okay? Because a lot of times when people think ungodly, they go, that person's ungodly. I would suppose this, and I'm not saying to beat yourself up over this, I would suppose everybody has some ungodly ways still. You know what I mean by that? Not godlike. You know, when you don't walk in love, it's not like God. When, right? When you don't when you don't walk in faith, it's not like God. Right? When you're not generous, it's not like God. When you're not a, a helpful person, it's not like God. When you complain, it's not like God. Right? When you uh, uh, when you practice fear, or you practice selfishness, or you practice unforgiveness, it's not like God. Right? So here you go. Here's a good point. You have lots of Christians all around the world. Right? Lots of Christians all around the world who hold unforgiveness in their heart. Hear me. They hold unforgiveness in their heart. But if you were to tell them that's ungodly, they'd get offended too now. Because if I just told you that Jesus himself said, 
forgive they know not what they've done. Stephen said it as well. Right? If Jesus said forgive and you don't forgive, you're ungodly. You're ungodly. See, a lot of people are worried about, don't you drink, don't you smoke, don't you fornicate, spit, and chew, hang around those do, but they never want to address a brother and go, hey, bro, hey, sister, hold on, sister, hold on, sister. That offense you got going on right now, that is evil and demonic. That's ungodly, sister. I would get out of that quickly. But people pet things like that. And then there'll be a brother over here that's drinking, doing drugs, or he's fornicating about, brother, that's demonic stuff right there, man. God is a, God is a, man, you better get straight and get your heart right with God. Man, you better get off that pornography and get off that, that crack pipe and you better get off that heroin. And, and man, as a matter of fact, you better start tithing. But let somebody have some unforgiveness, let them gossip, no one will ever address it. You know what I mean? Let them complain and people will be like, Oh, Lord. But do you know this? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it tells you a whole nation was destroyed for complaining. Because complaining is one of the worst things. It means in your heart that you don't really believe that God is able when he tells you he is. That you have more confidence in your own natural strengths and abilities than you do of your creator, your heavenly father, his power, his goodness, and his wisdom to deliver you and bring you out. A whole nation complained, didn't they? And it says they were destroyed by complaining. I'm talking about anything, just whining about anything. You know, you just got to grab your lips sometime and go, just complaining. And sometimes things come your way and they're tests. They're tests. You know, you were believing and expecting something bigger and it, and it, it didn't show up. It showed up like this. <laughs> You've been believing for like a hundred bucks and someone gave you a quarter. And you looked at that and you played it off and went, thank you. But when you walked away and just threw it in your pocket and didn't value it. And the Lord was watching. I didn't say the Lord sent it, but definitely he sees. Yes. Did you did you say my praise you father? Thank you for thinking about me. Thanks for thanks for giving me that. I'll I'll take that. I'll value that what that person gave me. That may have been that person's last quarter. Like the woman with the two mites. Remember the story that Jesus said he walks the treasury? Notice Jesus, he watches the treasury. I know a lot of Christians don't like that though, but Jesus be watching the bank account. He'd be like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's true. I, I can say this even today, you know. I was like, oh, you like those new shoes? Yeah. I was at the mall yesterday and I was going to buy these new shoes. I was like, man, I, I, you know, in the old days, I would have just bought them. And I was like, man, I'm not going to do it. And the person I was with, after a while, he looked I'll buy those for you, bro. Let me get those. I'm like, nah, that's cool, man. He's like, no, I'm gonna get those for you. Get them, get them, man. And I was like, I was like, I didn't say, are you sure? I just, I said, okay. <laughs> and he's like, remember you bought me a pair of shoes? He's like, he's like, you bought me a pair of shoes. When I had money, I, if I bought myself something, I bought other people something. I never bought something on my own. I remember one time I even went to this one place. And there were some other pastors there, and I was buying some. And just because they were there, I bought them some. Because I felt conscious, like, you know, maybe that person couldn't buy some for himself. Even if he looked like he could. You know what I mean? Some people look like they're all got money and stuff, but they really don't. They just dress in the park. So, but, you know, the reality is, is I, I spent that money because I believe in that. And that's why I'm alive today in COVID free. Because I believe there's areas that you operate in that roll over. Now, you can't buy a healing, but it rolls over into your faith life. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? Your, your faith life, because, it, see, a heart that's tense and tight isn't receptive to anything that God's doing. But when your heart is loose and free, it's generous, it's kind, how I many you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It, it opens up. 
You know, now, now none of us are just perfect in all the time in our generosity, but the reality is the less you can think about yourself, the better, the more blessings you'll get. So the grace of God teaches you. Where did I tell you to go? Oh, Romans 5. Here it is. He says, uh, Romans 5 verse 6, while we're in weakness, this amplifier says, powerless to help yourself. Look at you, you're powerless to help yourself today. And of, and of course, someone will go, they'll fight you. They'll go, no, I ain't. I'm not powerless to help myself. You are powerless to help yourself. You only think you can help yourself. The proverb says, lean up to your own understanding. Trust the Lord with all your heart. I realize you have authority, you have dominion, you have grace. It's God's grace that causes you to do all things through Christ who strengthens you, who empowers you to do his will. But outside of his power, you and I can't get ourselves out of a wet paper bag. But in Christ, we're overcomers. In Christ, we're more than conquerors. In Christ, we're not limited. Amen? So, look at this. He says, that grace of God teaches you denying ungodliness, worldly passions, pursuits. Let me, let me read in this. Here it is. It says, the same grace teaches you how to live each day as you turn our backs on ungodliness. You turn your back on all ungodliness, anything that's ungodly. When it's time to be offended at something, turn your back on it. See, I turned my back on that ungodliness yesterday. When that guy was sitting there and that fear tried to seep into my mind. And see, it, it's challenging to have to look at somebody not as they are, but who they should be or where they came from. You have to see, this is a, this, look, 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 this is training, friend. This is training. You can't just go to church and walk out and go, I went to church. I mean, I told my son the other day, he's playing baseball for a great team now. A great team. And I, it cost me money to go up there. I'm going to be honest with you. It cost some figures. Put gas in the tank. I left work at 1 o'clock. Supposed to work till 2.30 to 3. So I left work at 1. And then you know how much I make an hour probably. Try to figure. So I left work. So I missed those two to two and a half hours of work. Then I put $100 of gas in my car. Bought waters. And I bought Pedialyte because it was 103 degrees up at Ripon. And then I bought food twice. Then I had to pay the bridge. That was one day. One day. So I missed over a hundred and something dollars just leaving for a couple hours, paid the bridge, put a hundred in the gas. So it's like a three hundred and something dollar day. And I was there from left at one o'clock, picked him up. We were on the road by quarter to two, didn't get home till eleven o'clock that night, Friday night. So I had one to eleven, one to eleven. That's a ten hour work shift, man. It's a 10 hour work shift. And I told them, look, man, I'm not bringing, this isn't just regular kitty ball. If you're not going to follow and the directions and the things that I give you so that you can perform at an optimum level, then, then you got to let me know, man, because I'm, I'm out of the, I've stepped out of the boat here. I have financially. That was my second day in a row, too, by the way. And then I had two more days last week where I did the same thing. So I don't want to tell you, it's it's already a big investment because I believe. See, if you want to just play baseball, stay in San Francisco. You can have fun and go around. But if you want to get serious and, and, and believe that you're working your way to a good college on a scholarship and potentially to the MLB, then you need to take serious what I tell you. Don't tell me, well, I'm not thirsty. I already drank some water. See, you know when you hydrate? You don't drink when you're, see, most people are dehydrated. They're not thirsty. You drink before. If you're waiting to have a feeling, feeling, you're waiting to feel thirsty, you won't. It's too late. You're already dehydrated. Hydration has nothing to do, listen to this, with how you feel thirsty or not. See, you hydrate whether you're thirsty or not. It is a real standard. You hydrate. See, the, the day before, and I'll tell off on them. It was really hot, and I was telling him, and then he got in the car on the way home. His head was red. He, didn't, he was irritable. He didn't want to talk. His nose started bleeding. He was dehydrated, yet I'd given him three bottles of water. I gave him three bottles of that alkaline water this big, 
And you know what I told him? I said, that bottle was, that bottle evaporated in your body the first 15 to 20 minutes you stepped out on that hot black turf with 103 degree heat. And now you don't feel thirsty. It already's gone. You have to have double the amount. So what I'm telling you, my whole point of all that is there has to be a protocol for your life as a believer to feed yourself, to cultivate, to practice so that when the ungodliness comes, you recognize it, you see it for what it is, and you turn your back on it and resist it. See, if you want the grace, you've got to humble yourself under God's standard and structure. Not because he's God, because he wants you to live in victory. He wants you to constantly thrive and overcome. See, everything in you today is a, you, you're an overcomer already. You don't overcome just because you overcame a trial. See, if you're a Christian and you struggled your whole life as a Christian and you died and went to heaven and stood before Jesus, he'd say, hello, overcomer. And you're thinking, Lord, I struggled my whole walk. And he said, no, hello, overcomer. See, God didn't go, you're an overcomer because you overcame. He made you an overcomer. Then he expects you to take what you are and ex release that, express that, and live out of that truth in your life. You're not trying to be something. You already are. But once you get the revelation of that, that's what the devil don't want you to have. So you keep trying to live by grace. Instead of just receiving and acknowledging it and allowing that grace to help you turn your back on ungodliness. Amen? Amen? And the grace of God comes to you the more humbler you are. Now, of course, we always have to use Nancy as a nice, because uh, Nancy's really quiet. But she's, she's actually become a, a lot more bolder in these years because her faith has gone up. To Amen. You know. Amen. That's the truth. That's the truth. Amen. Amen. I'll tell you, if I put her in the focus, she'll preach. I'm not kidding. Come on. See, she could. <laughs> no, it's true. Everyone can. People that sat in this church. I've listened to you guys. You're in the Word. And every person in this church. But the reality is, Nancy has more of a, a relaxed, withdrawn, not, not an isolated, but just you no know, personality. So most of us would think she's really humble. Well, that's not, that may not be true. There's a lot of people that are withdrawn and internal, but they're plotting evil schemes. Right? <laughs> they're not humble at all. Now, we know Nancy's humble. But the reality, if you want the grace to function more, just look at James real quick. Look at James. I've got to finish these verses. And I'm going to get to a healing verse. Oh, man, we're, we're done. We're James, go to James and Peter. The same grace teaches you how to live each day. Turn your back on ungodliness and indulgent lifestyles. It equips you to live a self-controlled, upright, godly life. This person is. Look, if you don't have self-control, right? You're not allowing the Holy Spirit. You know why it says self? It doesn't want you to depend on you. But through the empowerment of the Spirit of God, now you can enforce the will of God in things in your life. Through the agency of the Holy Ghost, you can then enforce over ungodliness. See, you can't fight your way because we just read Romans 5. When you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. Why? To empower you to live the abundant life, to thrive, to live the victorious life. Now, when I say abundant life, I mean abundant joy, abundant faith, abundant love, not ensnared and in bondage and downhearted, discouraged in darkness and defeated. That's not God's plan for you and I. That's the devil's plan. Right? All the chaos you see in the world, that's the devil's plan. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So, right in the misses. It says, uh, verse uh, 14. He sacrificed himself that he might purchase our freedom from every lawless deed and purify himself a people who are his very own, passionate to do what is beautiful in his eyes. And then it goes on and says, So tell these truths, preach these truths, and exhort others to follow them. Be willing to expose sin in order to bring correction with full authority without being intimidated by anybody. Right? Bring the truth down. Look at, Jim, look at, uh, um, let me get over here. Let's look over here. At, uh, where, I said, I said James. All right, go to James. James 4. James 4. Let's see. James 4. We're going to finish up and then we're going to pray. James 4.
James chapter 4. Yes, sir. 6. James 6. James 4, verse 6. But he continues. No, no, let's read. Let's read verse 5. I'm reading from the TPT. Does the scripture mean nothing to you when it says the spirit that God breathed into your heart is a jealous lover who intensely desires to have more and more of us? Now, we know some jealous lovers that are insane, don't we? But he says, a jealous lover that God is. Now, God's jealousy is different than man's. He says, but he continues to pour out more and more grace. For it says, God resists you when you are proud. But he continually pours out grace when you're humble. So then surrender to God. Stand up to the devil. Resist him and he'll turn and run away from you. Move your hearts closer to God and he will come even closer to you. Make sure you cleanse your life. You sinners, keep your heart pure. Stop doubting. Stop doubting. Cleanse your heart. See, we try to get people to change. The first place they need to change is on the believing system inside. Most people need to repent for a lot of unbelief. They need to turn away from the doubt. Turn away from the self-life. Turn away from the life where they think you know, their own understanding, their own ways, their own education, their own money, their own race is going to get the job done. It ain't going to get the job done. Government ain't going to get the job done. You can see what's happening in a lot of government right now. Pray for your government, but I'm just telling you, don't look at the government. Scripture tells you, look unto Jesus, the author and finisher. He started the book, he finished the book. Amen. He started your life and he'll finish your life. Don't think anybody else can determine your destiny. Jeremiah said, I know the plans I have for you. He said, I know the plans the government has. Bill Gates has. Your mother has. Your father has. No, I know the plans. I've not lost sight of them, Jeremiah 29 said. 11. God said, I know the plan. No one can stop God's plan. Come on now. Amen. The devil can't stop God's plan. The only one that stopped God's plan is you hit the stop button in your life. You stop believing. You stop being faithful. You stop trusting. You hit Amen. the go button with we're complaining, with Amen. doubt, with fear, with the self-life. You know? And that usually happens through three agencies. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. If you listen to the devil, he says, man, you're too old now. You ain't going to get all these things, man. How do you ever going to buy a house, make money, cost? Man, stay in faith and patience and let the Lord work for you. Amen. He knows the earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and all they that dwell therein. His plans never fail. You walk through some valleys. Stay faithful to him. Don't look every day to see something manifest. Don't always look every day to see. Just be a doer. Be a doer. Follow the Holy Spirit. Heed the word and do it. Amen. Now the last part I wanted to read was. I want to get this in. Uh. Peter, and then I'm going to read one other healing verse, and then we're going to we're going to we're going to close. Uh, but we're in Peter, First Peter five, and I want to get into this page. First Peter five, and I have this highlight. Verse. Verse seven. First Peter five, verse seven. No, no, no. Verse six. Go to verse six. If you bow low. In God's awesome presence, he will eventually exalt you as you leave the timing in his hand. That's glorious what we just said. The timing ain't up to you. Bow low, man. Go low. Go low to go high. Come on. You got to go low. It's like those people that do those dances. They're like <laughs> under those poles. You got to go low to get back up. Come on. John the Baptist said, I must decrease, he must increase. If God increases in you, man, everything's going to change. He says, if you bow low in God's awesome presence, he will eventually exalt you. As you leave the time in him, pour out all your worries and your stress upon him. Leave them there, man. He, he always tenderly cares for you. Be well balanced and always alert. 
because your enemy, not your black brother, not your white brother, not your Filipino, Chinese, Hispanic, Italian, Saudi Arabian, didn't, didn't say that. He said that enemy of yours, the devil, the devil, the devil roams about incessantly like a roaring lion looking for its prey, taking a, deci take a decisive stance against him, resist his every attack with strong, vigorous faith. Oh, forgive them, Lord, that they don't know what they've done. Forgive them, Lord. Forgive them. And the devil will get your mind watching news and then thinking, look at all those people now. And everybody's battling each other and everybody got their opinion and their narrative on Facebook. Everybody got an answer. And so at some point, you just got to jump up out of that. And it says, for you, he says, for you know that your believing brothers and sisters around the world are experiencing the same kind of troubles that you endure. Who's right? God's right. God's right. Here's how you resist ungodliness. You resist ungodliness like Jesus. Matthew 8, real quick. Matthew 8, and then 1 Peter 2, 24. Here's how you resist ungodliness. Here's one, one of the ways that you and I need to be reminded to resist ungodliness. Matthew chapter 8, verses 1. And when Jesus came down from the mount, great bones followed him, and a leper came. A corona man came, glory to God. A coronavirus guy showed up, a leper, prostrating himself. He went low so God could bring him high. Worship him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you're able to cleanse me. See, he didn't know. By curing me, Jesus reached out his hand, touched him, said, I'm willing. Be cleansed, Corona man. Be free, Corona man. Be healed, Corona man. Be cured, Corona man. And Jesus didn't have, Jesus didn't have any antibacterial stuff on his hand either. And instantly that leprosy was cured and cleansed. Amen. Amen. Verse 14. And when Jesus went to Peter's mom's house, she laid there with a corona fever. And Jesus touched, touched, touched her hand. And a corona fever left. And she got up and began waiting. There's all kind of stuff. Even as I was looking on Facebook, they were saying, and this person caught corona, and this person, that man, I tell don't open your mind to that. Don't open up your mind to that. I'm not gel your hands when you shake someone's hand or touch someone's throat, but you don't want to move into mass phobia, man. You will drive yourself in fear and open up a portal hole for the enemy to attack you. Serious. For that thing I fear will come upon you. Don't be afraid. He says, I'm not telling you run around and go man, and be stupid. I just said don't be afraid of it. The power of God, the life of God, the grace of God is greater in you than what's in this world. And it says, when the evening was come, they brought him to him many, many under the corona power of demons. Many under the demonic corona. He drove out the spirits. See that? He drove out the spirits with his word and restored to health all who were sick. All, like they taught us in school, all means all. Jesus don't have a list that went, by my stripes you're healed except for corona. By my stripes you're healed except for AIDS. By my stripes you're healed except for addiction. By my stripes you're, you're healed except for the flu. Jesus, he healed all. Amen. Amen. All. And when you get that fully persuaded in you, then that's when the corona flees. If you're double-minded, it ain't going to leave. And thus fulfilled what was spoken. Isaiah said it. He took away to carry our weaknesses and infirmities and bore our sicknesses and diseases. Resist ungodliness by the grace of God. The last verse I want to read is in John 1, and then we'll close. John 1. I'm just saying that to remind you. Satan has no power over you. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to you. It's teaching you now. The Lord will teach you. He'll tell you, lay hands on the sick. Don't lay hands on the sick. Speak a word of healing or whatever. 
The Lord will direct you as many as are led by spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. Allow him to lead you. Allow him to direct you. The grace of God is sufficient for you. It's more than enough. It enables you to match any assault, any temptation, any adversity, any trial, any financial situation, any problem relationally. The grace of God is bigger than anything. Matter of fact, Romans 5 says, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. How much more? Wherever there's a stain of sin, you and I just come and dump the grace of God on them. You have to believe that, though. God is able, man, to pull you and I out and others out of this dilemma. Whatever it is, there's nothing that the, the arm of the Lord is not short. What did I tell you again? What was it? First John. No, first, I mean John. Excuse me. John 1. The grace of God. Unmerited favor, unmerited love. John 1 tells you, verse 16, of his fullness, he didn't leave none now. Of abundance you've all received. You are supplied with one grace after another. We were all supplied with that, that spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing. Favor upon favor. Gift heaped upon gift. For while the law was given by Moses, grace undeserved, unearned favor. Spiritual blessing came through Jesus Christ. Amen? The favor of God. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit with strength, ability, and power. Who went about doing good and healing. See? The grace of God that was upon Jesus caused him to go about doing good and healing, delivering, and setting free. That's all you and I are doing. We're problem solvers in the earth. Amen? Wherever there's a dilemma, have enough confidence. The grace of God, you can be sure. The grace is not just some, oh, I need grace to get through the day. That, that's not grace. That's called patience and strength. Grace is the unearned power of God, the supply and resource of, of God that comes in your life and works upon your natural being to enable you to match anything in this world. Anything. But ultimately, you have to do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. This message was brought to you by Living Water Fellowship San Francisco. You can connect with us on Facebook or email us at sflivingwater.com.